Hello, just came across this subreddit not too long ago, and after some story reading, I thought I'd share one that happened to me many years ago. It is kind of long, so I apologize for that. The story happened to me over 20 years ago, back in the summer of 1992. It was the summer between my first and second year of college, and I was working that summer on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. My father worked for the park service at the time and could pull some strings and get my siblings and I jobs working in the restaurants at national parks around the country. That summer, I went to work at the Bright Angel Lodge on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. First, some backstory as to what was going on in Arizona at the time. From 1990, to 1991, a man named Danny Ray Horning went on a bank robbing spree across the western United States that ended up with him getting arrested in Arizona in 1991. He was basically given a life sentence and put in prison near Phoenix, Arizona. He was also wanted in California for murder, but since he had basically a life sentence in Arizona, they decided not to extradite him there. In 1992, Horning put on a doctor's coat he had found at the prison and basically walked right out of it. He then proceeded to disappear with authorities having no idea where he went. The first reported sighting of him was when he kidnapped a couple in Flagstaff, Arizona, and they drove to the Grand Canyon. After driving in the Grand Canyon, Danny Ray tried to kidnap a family that went wrong and he ended up getting into a high-speed chase slash shootout with the park service police before ditching the car and fleeing into the woods. Danny had been in the military and had received survival training, so he knew how to survive off the land. At any rate, he eluded the police for the next month and a half by hiding out in the surrounding forest. Some 400 state and federal agents descended on the area to search for him. This made life interesting while living in the park. Helicopters would fly over the forest looking for him, and agents would patrol the area with assault rifles and canines. If you wanted to leave the park, you usually had to go through three police checkpoints. At one point, he was spotted in the area of my employee's dorm, so they brought police with canines to search each room. The restaurant I worked at had a huge kitchen and a long hallway on one end leading out the back. At the back of the hallway were the walk-in coolers. With my hours, I would get off of work at 2.30 a.m. And at this time, there would only be two other dishwashers and myself, as well as another man who would come in to start prepping for breakfast. The kitchen was massive, and there was hardly any way to notice if anyone else walked into the back hallway. The manager and cooks noticed some things missing from the walk-in coolers at one point, and they checked surveillance video and saw someone who appeared to be Danny Ray as he snuck in, and he went into one of the walk-in coolers, and he got food and left. Even with all this going on, I just kind of kept about my business and I didn't really think I would have a run-in with him or anything. I also didn't really have access to a TV or read the papers much, so I didn't know much about what was going on with the whole situation other than by word of mouth. In these jobs, you would usually start out working in the kitchen as a dishwasher or in the restaurant as a busser. I started out working as a dishwasher, and I worked the evening shift starting at 6 p.m. and ending at 2.30 a.m. When I would get off of work at 2.30 a.m., I would have to walk back to the employee housing because the public shuttle had stopped running hours before. The employee housing was about two miles from the restaurant, and I had two options on how I could walk there. The first was to walk along the main road through the park that took you past the visitor center, then by the general store. It wasn't very pretty, as it was just a dirt path 
basically alongside the road, but was a bit safer, as it was patrolled by park rangers. The second option was to walk along the Grand Canyon Rim Trail, and that was for about a mile, which connected up with another trail that would take you through the woods and dump you out at the visitor center along the main road. This option was much prettier, as you would walk along the edge of the Grand Canyon and the forest as well, but it was also somewhat scary because it was pitch black out with no light, unless of course the moon was out. I liked to walk this route because it was so beautiful with the stars looking so bright and also the big empty black void of the canyon right next to you. Going this way also made me nervous since I'd heard about there being mountain lions in the park and also who knows what kind of person I might run into out late for a night stroll along the canyon. That night, I decided to walk along the rim trail as I had my flashlight with me. I made it along the rim trail without any sort of incident and connected with the trail that cuts over to the visitor center. This trail is a little bit scary as it cuts through the pretty thick woods for about half a mile before arriving at said visitor center. This trail is usually pitch black at this time of night with not even moonlight penetrating through the thick trees. I walked the trail until I was almost at the visitor center and remembered that behind the visitor center is an amphitheater and I'd never seen it before. So I wanted to go to see what it looked like even though it was now about 3 a.m. and it was pitch black out. The amphitheater is a short walk through the woods before you arrive at it. I walked over to it and walked around it and up on the stage the whole time shining my flashlight around to get a good look at it. It's kind of a crude amphitheater with just basically an elevated platform surrounded by benches and with a forest surrounding the whole thing. I was shining my flashlight around the area when suddenly I hear rustling in the surrounding trees. I get a little nervous knowing that it's not wind as there was no wind that night and I think it might be an animal or something. I hear it again, so I shine my flashlight out into the forest to see if I see anything. I stepped off the stage and walk in the direction I heard it coming from, all the meanwhile shining my flashlight around through the trees. At this point, I was past all the benches of the amphitheater and entering the surrounding forest. I then hear the rustling again. It was getting louder, so I knew I was getting closer to it. Now, I grew up in the mountains of Colorado and I have come across animals in the woods before. When they make noise, it is usually pretty constant, such as when they are moving around and you might hear twigs breaking, but this time, I wasn't hearing that. These were much more controlled rustling noises that would happen every couple of minutes. I keep walking further into the forest and shining my flashlight, when suddenly I briefly see something shining through the trees. I walk towards it and get closer to it and I see what looks like a large bag laying on the forest floor. I keep walking towards it and all of a sudden I see it rustle as if something is inside or underneath it. Finally, I'm about five or six feet from it. I see it is several feet long and shining on the outside. I keep my flashlight on it and at this point I'm just inching towards it. I must know what is in it. All of a sudden, the bag rolls toward me and a face pops out of it. I shine my flashlight on the face for a second and it is at this point that I realize it is someone sleeping out here in the woods wrapped up in a blanket and what looks like a thermal blanket on top of it. They must just be camping out here. The face is of a man, and he has reddish blonde hair and a mustache. His eyes are closed still, so it looks like he is still sleeping. Behind the bag, I see a backpack, so I quickly 
shut off my flashlight so as to not wake him up. He is sleeping, after all. I then start slowly backing up. I get all the way back to the trail, continuing to hear the rustling occasionally the whole time. Then, I walk the main trail up past the visitor center, and eventually, I get back to the housing without incident, but somewhat spooked the whole time, and constantly checking to make sure I wasn't being followed. I was somewhat spooked by this the next couple of days, but then I realized that it wasn't that unusual to see people sleeping in their cars, or campers in the parking lots, or maybe even out in the woods in a tent, though it is against the park rules, because they would arrive late to the park or just didn't want to pay the high hotel rates. What did strike me as weird was that when I had seen people camping before, they were usually close to their car and would have a tent or other gear with them. The situation seemed weird, mainly because this guy had only had his backpack and just looked like a blanket is all. Also, the nearest parking lot was at the visitor center and I didn't see any cars that night. But at any rate, I just kind of shrugged it off. I even walked by the spot the next day and I didn't see anything or any evidence he was there. This happened just a few days after it was made official that Danny Ray Horning had entered the park, but I hadn't seen what he looked like yet. This was also long before the park became overrun with authorities searching for him. Then one day, I happened to see a wanted picture of him, and I was shocked to see that he had blonde hair and a mustache. The wanted notice also said that he was last seen with reddish blonde hair after recently dyeing it. I'm pretty certain that the man I saw that night was him. Maybe he was asleep. Maybe he was just pretending to be. I'll never know. Now even though he never hurt any civilians during his escape, he did kidnap several to use as hostages, so who knows what he would have done. At any rate, he was eventually caught after he kidnapped two women and forced them to drive out of the park. They managed to drive through the two police roadblocks after the police failed to recognize him and waved them on. He then tied the women to a tree near Sedona and fled in their vehicle. The women escaped and called the police, who then spotted the car and another high-speed chase slash shootout happened before he fled again into the woods. The next morning, a man spotted him in his backyard drinking from his hose and called the police who searched the area, but they couldn't find him. The next morning, a policeman went back to that house to research it and found him sleeping under their gazebo and arrested him. He was also extradited back to California and tried for the earlier murder and today, he is currently sitting on death row in San Quentin prison. This story takes place back in late 2009. As a young kid, my friend and I would spend all summer exploring the surrounding areas and our small New England town. We would spend all day just exploring anything and everything that we could find. One day, my father told us about an abandoned restaurant that was deep in the woods. And my father told us the story about when he was our age in the early 70s. The restaurant was owned by the local mafia and that group was under investigation at the time for some local people that went missing. The rumor around town was that the mafia had killed the missing people and dumped the bodies in the quarry that was in the back of the restaurant. This was never proven, mind you, but it was never disproven either. After hearing this story, it made my friend and I want to find this location even more. By the time we went looking for the location, it had been long closed and most of the records had been lost to time. The rest of the summer, it was our goal to find this location. Then on a still September evening, we found the location. At the time, we had such a rush 
that we finally found the location that we had been looking for. We had about two hours left the sun, so we decided to do as much exploring as we could for the day. We started to walk around the outside of the area, which had been almost fully taken by nature. When we finally got to the main building, it was still in decent shape for being unused for 20 plus years. After a little while exploring the outside of the building, we found a way in the building through a broken door. We took out our old flip phones and used the screens as a small light. At this point, we had about an hour of sunlight left and it was soon to be dark. So we walked around the upper part of the restaurant and all of a sudden, we heard a noise that broke the quiet still air. I looked at my friend and in a low voice, I asked him if he heard that. He shook his head and mouthed the words, yes. So, at this point, we thought it was just an animal, so we kept on exploring. We finally got to the lower part of the restaurant, and as we talked down the steps, we heard another noise, much like the first one we heard. At this point, my friend was freaking out, and was pulling on my arm to head out of the building, right as I turned my head to look at him. I caught a black object that darted from one side of the hall to the other. At this point, I was freaked out as well, and I wanted to get the hell out of that place as fast as I could. At this point, we are hauling ass up the steps and running as fast as we can to the broken door. At this point, the sun had almost fell behind the trees as we made it out of the building. I swear. We didn't stop running for what felt like miles, and when we felt we had gotten far enough away, we stopped. Gasping for breath, we turned and looked at each other, and he had that look in his eyes that said it all. We had no idea if what we saw was real or just made up in our mind. We walked back to my house regardless, and by the time we got back in, it was about 9pm. We talked about what we saw and made a plan to head back the next day during the morning and to see if we can find out if it was real or not. The following morning, my friend and I made the hour or so walk back to the building. The first thing we did when we got there was we go and look in the area that we had been in the night before. We entered the building as quietly as we could. We got to the lower part of the building and we looked in the area where I saw the black figure on the floor, it was a mess of old bedding and nasty looking shirts and pants as well, but no person. After seeing this, we got very unnerved and we wanted to leave the area. We left the building and we decided to try and find the quarry that my dad had told us about. It took us about 10 minutes, but we eventually found it and we wanted to walk around the outside of the huge rock face. We got about halfway around the huge circle when we heard some sounds that sounded like heavy footsteps no more than 20 feet away from us. Before we could figure out what was happening, a huge nasty looking man in his late 40s with long light colored hair jumped out and tackled my friend. I then started to kick and punch the man trying to get him off of my friend. After what felt like an eternity, the man got up, pulled out a large hunting knife from his pants, and in this moment, the man was going for the knife, but I pulled my friend up, and we ran as fast as we could so we can get away from the old man. We sprinted as fast as we could, just like the night before, but this time, we knew what we saw was real. We got back to my house in about half the time it normally takes us. We got back inside, locked the door, and fell to the floor, scared and shocked. My friend wanted me to call my dad and to tell him what we just went through. But at the time, I was really scared and too shocked to do anything. So we waited until both my parents got home to tell them what took place. We told them the story from the night before and what took place that day as well. After telling them this story, we could tell they didn't fully think what we told them was the truth. So, 
My friend and I just went to my room and got upset that my parents didn't believe us. We tried to get over it and tried to move on. Later that night, my friend and I were sitting in the living room playing some video games at about 11 p.m. At this point, we had started to move on from the events of the day when, all of a sudden, we saw the backyard light turn on and we got scared and we had a flashback to the events of the day. I built up the nerve to go to the back door and look outside. I noticed that my shed door was cracked open and I knew for a fact we always keep that door shut. So, I ran up to my parents' room and I shook my dad awake so I could get him up to see what's going on outside. Annoyed that I woke him up, he soon agreed and walked down and saw what we were talking about and wanted to take a look and see what was outside. He cracked the door and slowly walked to the shed. My dad got about five feet away from the shed when an older man ran out of the shed and ran into the woods in the back of my house. My dad ran to the house and told me to call the police. I did, and within five minutes, the cops ended up showing up. I had to tell my story of what took place at the abandoned building in the woods. After telling the cops what took place, they went to go look in the shed, and they found a large hunting knife on the floor. The police took it and told my parents they would have cops in the area looking for the man. A week passes and the police had not caught the man or had any new information, so we started to move on again. Fast forward about eight years later, my friend and I are now in college. I was calling my mom one day and she said she had a story she needed to send me. She sent it to me and it was a story of a local man that had gone missing a week ago and that was while hiking in the woods that surrounded my town. The man was found dead in the same building many years ago that I had the encounter with the old man. Now, I'm not saying he had anything to do with it, but it seems like a strong connection. At the time of me writing this, they have never found the person who had killed the man in the building. So, to the old man in the woods, I hope I never see you again. This happened to me over 30 years ago, but I remember the feeling of fear as if it were yesterday. I am female. I was in college and I was taking a course in outdoor survival. The course ended with a three-day, three-night wilderness solo. We were allowed to take a backpack, empty canteen, sleeping bag, knife, six matches, rope, a sheet of plastic, a change of clothing, extra socks, tablets for disinfecting water, small cooking pot, and spoon. We were not allowed to bring food or water since part of our training was in identifying edibles and finding a water source. Once I was dropped off, I had to hike in to find a spot to set up camp. First, I had to place a flag on a tree near my drop-off point so that I could be located three days later for pickup. I was loving life, just me, in nature. I had no fears, even as night began to fall. I enjoyed the sounds of the woods all around me, and I didn't mind not having a tent either. I built a small fire, and I had a great feeling of peace. I slept well that night, but I woke up thirsty. My search for a water source began. Happily, I found a muddy stream. I let the water settle in my pot, placed the tablets in the water, and boiled it for good measure. Yuck, what a crappy taste, but at least I was hydrated. All went well, and I had a great time, until my last day. It was early afternoon on the last day, and it was time to break camp. I cleaned up my camp area and hiked out to my drop-off spot. As I sat, leaning against a tree, I heard the sound of a vehicle off in the distance. I figured that it had to be my pickup, and as I waited, 
A vehicle that I'd never seen before pulled up on the dirt path in front of me. Immediately, I realized that I did not know the man who was driving. He gave me an odd look. My gut told me that he was bad news. He asked what I was doing there and if I was alone. I said that my friends were behind me breaking camp. He gave me a knowing look, got back in his vehicle, and rode off. I was terrified. I knew that I had to hide, and fast. I ran into the woods and hid. And as I ran, I heard the car come back. I stayed as quiet as I could, and I remained hidden. I heard him get out of the car. I could hear him calling to me and walking through the brush looking for me. I was so afraid. Eventually, he gave up and I heard the car door slam, the engine start, and the car pull away. Going back to my drop off point was no longer an option, so I began hiking through the woods, hoping I was going to find base camp. After walking, for what felt like hours, I saw a forest ranger. I told him who I was and what had happened to me. He told me that I had done the right thing since a young woman had been raped the night before and the police and forest service had been searching the area. Happily, he drove me to the base camp where I learned that another girl in my class had a creepy encounter with a man the night before. She had scared him away by blowing a brass whistle until help arrived. If there is anything to be learned from this, it is being sure to always trust your gut feelings and never camp alone. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground? The Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and rode every road. Every day, I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails, and I would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had rode out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. They have a live buffalo roam there, and there is a large spring slash fountain for all of them to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up, and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek, and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time, and all I had to use to see was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise, which sounded like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock about the size of a baseball rolling across the trail. Me, confused, starts to look up to the side of this hill. Just as I turn my head to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down and hitting my front wheel. I finally have my eyes adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark who is covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled at a cell phone and I was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This however seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. I, for obvious reasons, get on my bike and I take off. And just as I cross the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek and seen it was a large rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning, and I told the ranger about what happened. He says, So, you were attacked by Bigfoot? Then he laughs. Me. I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. Park Ranger. Okay, Justin, if I have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I just said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight. 
when Park Ranger pulled up next to me and said for me to get in. I asked why. He said he needed to show me something. So we headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I have to give you a huge apology. I will be honest that I didn't believe you when you told me that story of you being attacked. However, it has come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night and was attacked in the same way. They said they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other park rangers, including myself. I immediately thought about what you had told me when we arrived and started up the hill. Sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns were drawn and there's yelling. Two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five tall, naked, covered in mud, and had long hair and a large beard as well. Apparently he'd escaped from the veteran center across Veterans Lake. Apparently he thought he was back in Vietnam and he was trying to take out the enemy. Park Ranger said I was very lucky because he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statement as to what happened. They had sent him to a more secure facility somewhere else. But to this day, I still get the shivers when I hike that trail. And I always keep my eyes on the ridge top as well. I do feel bad for ones with PTSD and such mental illnesses. But Mr. Crazy Naked Bigfoot Man, let's not meet again. I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies as well as a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often as I load us up in the van and drive ten minutes to the wooded metro park. I love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some bicycles and skis, some just people. And last year, they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark, with no leaves on the trees. You can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits and rangers patrolling regularly and the hospital behind CVS. It means there's emergency medical care in walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and it was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part, so we're walking, not yet jogging, again. But after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. Then my youngest had an appointment, and then I had to run a few errands. And then we had an unexpected visitor right after school, and they stayed for dinner. Finally, I got the dogs into the van, and we made it to the park just before it started to get dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day, but as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized we had been walking the sunset, watching it over the lake and the hills and through the bare trees, and the park was clearing out. Now as it started towards dark, we would very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs hike the pet path. All those little irritations had led up to the singular moment of beauty that I would not otherwise have seen and appreciated. This was going to be a really good walk. Funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot at the farthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile long, people 
walkers, or joggers only, path, looped through the woods and by the lake and came out by the bathroom. I liked to run it when I came here alone. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods, my feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky. I absolutely loved it. About halfway now, the city sounds had faded away until I could only hear the birds and frogs and insects all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. Crack, utter silence and absolute stillness. My dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and we froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature sounds to return. They did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, first standing on end all around their shoulders and necks, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me down the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put ears back and heads down and began to pull me. So off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill, not seen him, and after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree and his hoof hit a dead branch, and the branch broke and cracked and scared everyone. Why were the woods still silent? Maybe there's somebody up there. Homeless people must stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat, so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far out as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's setting up a shelter, and crack broke a branch. Why were the woods still silent? We were about as far from the city as we could get in these woods, and you couldn't see the CVS sign, or the glow from the street lights, or even hear the traffic noises. It was dark, and still, and absolutely quiet, except for the panting dogs, and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run, the dogs wanted to run, Bigfoot. That was a Bigfoot breaking a log to say, get out. There are no Bigfoot in city limits, I promise you that. It was a deer, at least that's what my brain was telling me. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog here. Yes, they're the big huskies, and another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts, and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves. I can lift a hundred pounds over my head. We are the scariest thing in these woods. There's no bear. There's no wolves. There's no Bigfoot. There are deer, and there are foxes, and there might be an angry raccoon, but we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing in these woods. Unless... Of course, there's someone with a gun. Shut up, you're not helping, I tell myself. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We'd gone almost a mile now. Me talking to myself in my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could see in all directions while letting the dogs pull me down the path. It was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose. Not a cricket. Nothing moved. Nothing made a sound. Except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on this trail. I had been running these to rebuild my strength as well as my endurance. But if I ran this, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested. 
You couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where, if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait, unseen, for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around. It was just a deer. What if it's behind us? Ambush. Deer. Gun. Bigfoot. This is why I run. The noise in my head is unbearable otherwise. Up the hill. Walk. Pay attention. Watch the dogs. The dogs were still on alert, but didn't hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just walk. Don't get smoked. Be able to run or fight if you have to. Yeah, okay. I'm scared too. The woods should not still be silent. The dogs should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's Bigfoot, but it could be a person. So let's be smart. Just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will and they'll follow his lead. Be smart and get out. Only another mile now to the lake and the first parking lot. Then another half mile along the lake to the second lot where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets, no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic and shit, shit and blood, and partially digested grass. I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted these woods, and the dogs were not all interested in the smell. So we ran. I don't remember much of that last mile. We just ran. Desna, with a big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. Then she began to sniff and pee. The boys followed her lead. There was a single truck parked. I relaxed quite a bit, but I still felt on the edge. Down the lake in the next parking lot, I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot, closest to the lake. Their headlights illuminated the lakeside path. There, watching us, halfway to the van now, and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van, I heard a motor coming down the nearest path, so I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger's side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest, and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it was an absolute certainty. Finally, the dogs were in. I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt, starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas, and as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me there was something across the handlebars. A gun? A deer carcass? I couldn't tell, and because of the angle when pulling away, I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror at all. This is something that happened to myself and a friend as kids, and is more of a disturbing discovery than a disturbing person. We were probably somewhere between 11 to 14 years old at the time, and it was the middle of summer. It was also something that I didn't really come to understand until much later in my life when there was no way to resolve what he and I had seen. My house was in a valley. There were a few houses along the street with it, 
but the hills on either side were undeveloped forest back then. Me and my friend would hike up the hill behind my house, through a few miles of woods, and out the other side, where there was a neighborhood that had a farm stand style shop with local honey and a bunch of cheap candy. We also just hung out in the woods a lot and would tell each other scary stories as we headed back home. None of them were all that scary looking back on the ones I can remember, but younger me was always a little bit spooked on the way back to my house. One dusk, while we were heading back for the day, I spotted a bit of white in a mound of moss. As a kid, I was always looking for interesting stuff to take home and collect, so I was immediately ready to go dig it out of the moss. When I did, I found it was a pelvis bone. It had probably been there for a very long time. I remember it was pockmarked and dirty, worn away slightly from time. I was pretty scared for a second, but I remembered that all sorts of animals have pelvis bones and that this one must be from a deer or something. In my childish need to know it all and jumping at my first non-frightening possibility, I told my friend it was a deer pelvis. We marveled at it for a bit, but put it back because I knew my dad would be mad if we brought back an old deer bone. I forgot about it for a long time. Many, many years went by, but eventually I learned more about the shape of human bones as opposed to animals. I remember the shape I found quite clearly. It was almost certainly a human bone, and the size wouldn't have been an adult. I wonder what else was in that mound, who it might have been, and if my finding it could have given someone somewhere some sort of closure. I went back and looked for it twice, thinking I might remember the part of the woods it had been in, but I never found it again. I was about eight or nine years old when this happened. I grew up in a small town in Norway, so stuff like this happening didn't really concern me that much, considering this was a very safe place to grow up. Anyway, my brother played for our local soccer team with his classmates, and they were going away for like two days. That was to a tournament of some sorts, and they had to be accompanied by their parents, because he's just four years older than me, and they were too young to be sent alone. Nobody could take care of me that weekend, so I had to come along with them all, and quite frankly, I wanted to, because this was quite the big city, and considering I was used to the rural town area, this could be a great experience for me. So on one of the days while we stayed there, I got bored of watching the soccer matches and I got my parents' approval to explore the surrounding area as long as I didn't stray too far away. I got my friend, one year younger than me, to come along with me and we eventually stumbled upon a secluded track field surrounded with woods. After some walking, we found a mattress the kind that is used to cushion the fall after jumping over a stick. I didn't find the right word to translate, so I tried to describe it the best way I could. It was lying at the edge of the field, really close to the dense forest surrounding it. We started just jumping around on the mattress, having fun, while all of a sudden, this creepy older dude, probably in his late 40s or early 50s, sits down on the mattress and stares at us. He starts asking us our names, what we're doing there, and if we could show him our skills. I remember I obliged to his request of us showing him some tricks, but I was feeling quite scared at the time because somehow in my mind I was just convinced he was an alcoholic. Note, I was scared shitless of people who drank alcohol in my younger days mostly because I'd overheard some conversations that they could be unpredictable. Anyway, a few minutes go by and he asks us if we could be so kind and go and retrieve his crutch 
that he had stashed somewhere behind a building. He pointed at a building like 500 meters away, which looked to be abandoned. I answered him that we could, and we started walking towards to where he had pointed. As me and my friend walked, I silently whispered in my friend's ear that he was an alcoholic and that we should probably run to our parents. My friend didn't understand the big deal, so I had to argue with him to get with me. Finally, he obliged, and when we saw we had a good distance from the man, we ran as fast as we could towards the same way that we had come from earlier. All I could hear in the background was the man shouting, Hey, get back over here. I didn't turn to look once, and I didn't stop running until I saw my parents. No idea what he was planning to do, but I know for a fact that he didn't have any good intentions. I think I told my parents what happened, but I guess they just brushed it off, since I was quite the paranoid kid, and they just assumed I had exaggerated. There has been plenty of cases of molestation involving children in the east of Norway, which is where this took place but I cannot remember his face, so I wouldn't be able to recognize him on any sort of pictures. I'm from the United Kingdom, if that's any context. So way back in 2016, when the whole killer clown epidemic was huge, I was walking through the woods at around 10pm and this was alone in order to get to a party slash gathering that was happening in a secluded part of the forest. It was almost pitch black and I could barely see in front of me besides the flash of my phone and everything seemed normal as I was walking to the party. I got to a long stretch of woods with no defined path but it was the quickest way to the party so I took it. As I got around midway through, I heard something to my left. I turned and I saw a shadowy figure sat on a fallen log. I was understandably unnerved, but I couldn't make out if it was just shadows from the moonlight or if it was an actual person. I made the mistake of shining my phone light directly at it and I was instantly terrified. Sat there, alone, in the middle of the woods, was a largish man dressed as a clown with full face paint and sporting the creepiest smile imaginable. I tried to call five different people as I was passing him, and then I heard him get up behind me. I instantly started sprinting towards the end of the long stretch, onto a path which had a barbed wire fence down the side of it. During the sprint, I was pretending to be on the phone with one of my friends, and I could hear him running after me, but there was no chance in hell that I would be turning around to see if I was right. When I got to the path, I jumped over the fence as fast as I could and I sliced my hands open as I did so. I then turned around and kept running backwards as I saw the clown stood behind the fence and just started staring at me smiling. I didn't stop running until I got to the party and I was scared for a very long time after this. Now you have to bear in mind there were so many rumors of people being killed by people dressed as clowns at this time, and while I will never know if the man had evil intentions or was just trying to scare me, it was extremely strange and scary to live through. So in conclusion, killer clown man from the woods, let's not meet. Now, I don't know if this is going to sound scary through writing, but it definitely was if you were there. So a few years back, I was cruising around with my brother, cousin, and a few friends. We decided to go down this creepy back road. We got to the end of it, and there was a trail that continued off of it. We decided to get out and walk the trail, even though it was pitch black out. We didn't really have a good feeling about the place, but we pressed on anyway. Now let me say that if anyone else had come down the road, 
we would have seen their headlights in the woods. So after walking for a little bit, we all went back to the cars. My friend Alex stopped and said, What's that noise? We all stopped talking and we heard a hissing noise. His tires on his car had been slashed. We all panicked because nobody else would be at this dead end back road in the middle of nowhere this late at night. So we got in the cars and took off, not too far down the road. His car was undrivable and we had to squeeze him in our jeep. We went to a gas station to get some snacks and when we came out, the jeep's tires were slashed too. I don't know how that could have happened, so it seems like someone had followed us and slashed our tires in the process. So creepy forest dwelling tire slasher, let's not ever meet. I've recently begun helping my mom sell my childhood home and it sparked the memory of possibly the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Me and my friends were 15 years old. I grew up in a subdivision about 20 minutes away from any towns. It was a very safe neighborhood, street lights on the corners, and lots of kids. Lots of my classmates lived there as well, and there was never any fear with us walking to each other's houses or staying out after dark. My subdivision was about three miles long, and I lived at the very end of it. The last mile is a sharp right turn into a hill and has thick woods along both sides of the street with four houses at the bottom, which is all surrounded by woods. My friend Maddie lived at the entrance to the subdivision. One year, we got about eight inches of snow and ice. It shut down the roads. People were stranded. Schools closed for a week. The first day of the snow, me, Maddie, and Kelly spent the whole day playing. We decided to have a big sleepover at Maddie's house that night. When the sun looked like it might start to set, we started the trek down to my house to get an overnight bag. By the time we finished packing, it was dark out. The woods always enhanced the darkness, but it didn't bother us. The three of us started walking, joking, enjoying the night air. As we cleared the top of the hill, we saw something that made us stop in our tracks. There was a hooded figure standing on the corner, illuminated only by the street light. They didn't move. They stood completely still, staring straight ahead. It was unsettling, but it easily could have been a neighbor, so with nervous laughs, we started descending the hill. The figure never moves, staring straight ahead. As we got to the bottom, we could see the hood was fur-lined and they had some sort of black mask hiding their features. As you might expect, we started to get nervous. At this point, we're even with this person. It's blackout, the one street light illuminating the corner. After staring at the figure for about 45 seconds, Maddie finally called out. Hey, stop messing with us. It's not funny. At this point, the figure moved, only shuffling its feet to turn its body in our direction. They extended their hand towards us. Time stopped. I could feel my heartbeat in my throat. The figure now gestured, come here, to us, before turning and walking into the woods. We ran. We ran as fast as our feet would take us until we reached Maddie's house and deadbolted the door behind us. The next morning, when I walked home, I stopped at the corner where the figure had been and felt pure, genuine fear. There were two tracks of footprints, one leading out of the woods and one leading back in. Some time ago, in the late 90s, I was a teenager and in high school. I worked a couple of different jobs at a shopping center that was along the same highway that my neighborhood was located on. Between the shopping center and the neighborhood was an open field and a stretch of woods. 
One afternoon, I was at work and I noticed a lot of police cars that kept patrolling the shopping center, the highway, and the roads around it. Helicopters joined in shortly after so they could help them in the process. Out of curiosity, I asked around with friends and employees. Now I learned that a man had been part of some crime spree, I think robbery related, and he had taken off on foot after he'd been spotted in the parking lot. The last they had seen him, he had run off towards the fields and the direction of my neighborhood. Work got busy, so I didn't think much of it. Aside from pondering if they'd find him whenever I'd see a police car drive past again. Soon, my break time came, so I called my mother to let her know to watch out for strangers. What she told me made my blood run cold. She had been at home on her day off and she had plans to work in the garden. After doing some work, she had taken a break to go inside and had left the front door open with a glass screen door shut. Not long after, there was knocking and the doorbell rang. When she went to look, there was a scruffy man there asking if he could come in to borrow her phone. Now, normally she had had no problem being polite and helping somebody out, but something about this man rang internal alarms with her, so she politely declined and shut and locked the door. Soon after, she saw the news reports about the manhunt, but didn't realize it was going on so close. When I called, she put two and two together and realized that it was the same man. By the time she had made this realization, it was too late to call the police because reports were showing that he had been found when nobody would let him in to use their phones. He had climbed into the back of a box truck that was parked in the neighborhood for a company out doing business there. He was found a few miles later when they stopped to get gas at a nearby gas station. Thankfully, he was apprehended and my mother was safe. But to the stranger who committed serious misdeeds and could have hurt my mother, let's not meet. Hey there everyone, thanks for watching today's video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and make sure to leave a comment telling me what you thought. Also, if this is the first time you're joining us on the Creepy Fox Podcast, make sure to subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads that are coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to get yourself some Creepy Fox merch, then check right below the video. Whether it's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it, go ahead and check it out. Also, if you'd like to go ahead and support the channel too, you can consider becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to brand new uploads, as well as exclusive videos that aren't available to anyone else. Now with that said, I would like to go ahead and give a thank you to the channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Corey, Jen, and Sylvia. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the channel, leave likes, comments, and share the channel with their family and friends. Now with that said, I'll go ahead and see you all in the next episode of the Creepy Fox YouTube Podcast. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.